A man has gone on trial. The jury has been warned the case may take between six and nine months. It's a very intense atmosphere. It took the jury a couple of days to come to a verdict. The verdict was guilty. Over the last two decades, Scotland has witnessed many emotional courtroom moments, from family-led campaigns... What's going to explain how I feel? All we wanted was justice, and we were very scared. ..to high court drama. This case has been controversial and high-profile from the start. Trials that grip the nation. Probably the most harrowing deal of any high court trial I've ever covered. And decisions that altered the legal system forever. Scottish law had to be changed in order to make this possible. In this episode, a gangland rivalry spills into public view and a long fight for truth. These are the trials that shot Scotland. On a seemingly normal day in Rob Royston in the northeast of Glasgow, shoppers are going about their usual business. A man has been shot dead in broad daylight in a busy supermarket car park in Glasgow in an apparent gangland killing. He's understood to be Kevin Carroll, who's said to have links to organised crime. The day he was murdered at the supermarket car park completely shocked the whole of the country. It was just so unexpected that broad daylight, afternoon, folk going about their shopping, that there would then be this assassination. Shoppers were prevented from leaving Asda until they could be questioned by police. According to police, Kevin Gerbil Carroll was a high-ranking member of a criminal gang from the north of Glasgow. He was at the epicentre in the war to control the city's drug market. He was involved in targeting drug dealers and rival gangs, abducting them off the street. They would interrogate them, torture them, and effectively force them to hand over whatever money they had, whatever drugs they had. He was a very ruthless, ambitious criminal at that time who had made a lot of enemies. It's not unusual for there to be gangland killings in parts of Scotland, unfortunately, but usually these are very targeted acts. There was a lot at stake. You had major gangland figures, a lot of, the, a lot of pressure on the police to get a conviction. Using eyewitness statements and footage from CCTV cameras around the supermarket, police put together a timeline of events. After a meeting outside the supermarket, Kevin Carroll and two associates returned to the black Audi. Kevin got in the back seat. A Volkswagen Golf pulls up and blocks them in. At this juncture, two men come out of the car, they're both masked, they're both armed, and they just open fire on the Audi. 13 bullets were fired in the space of 25 seconds into the back of that black Audi. The CCTV footage showed terrified shoppers running back from the car park into the store for cover. There was discharged bullets everywhere, screaming, shocked onlookers, terrified that the gunman was going to turn, turn the gun on them. The Volkswagen Golf was seen leaving at speed after the shooting. Two days later, police found the getaway car 10 miles away, torched and with the registration plates removed in an attempt to destroy any evidence. 13 days after the murder, the guns believed to be used in the shooting were discovered three miles from the burnt out vehicle. They were found behind Cope Bridge Library. This was part of the unusual negligence, I guess, of this particular crime and how it was committed, that these guns were left lying around where the public could come across them. Evidence from the guns and police intelligence provided detectives with two lead suspects, William Patterson and Ross Monaghan. Both men had been linked by police to a rival criminal gang with a grudge against Kevin Carroll. Six months after the shooting, in a dawn raid, Ross Monaghan was arrested by armed police and charged with the murder of Kevin Carroll. But 
by this time, Patterson had disappeared to Spain and a, a major hunt was launched for him. Police later discovered that 10 days after the murder of Carroll, Patterson had gone into hiding in the Costa del Sol. Almost two years after his arrest at the High Court in Glasgow, Ross Monaghan pleaded not guilty. The prosecution's case rested on two key pieces of evidence, a minuscule DNA sample that had been found on one of the guns and a trace of gunpowder residue from a jacket owned by Monaghan. Now, because of developments in forensic technology, it is now possible to get more and more information about smaller and smaller forensic samples. And that, on one level, can be extremely helpful for the authorities, but it can also be problematic. The prosecution's case was hit by a revelation which cast doubt on the evidence presented to the jury. How do you get someone's DNA on a weapon? How do you get gunshot residue on your coat? One explanation might be you pulled the trigger of a gun shortly before and were wearing the coat at the time. However, another interpretation is you're arrested by police officers who are just at the gun range and who are themselves covered in gunshot residue. It later came out that the police had been on a, a shooting exercise earlier that day, so they were covered in gun residue because they hadn't changed their uniforms and it could have been transferred. The court heard that DNA from a lab technician who hadn't touched the gun was also found in the weapon, raising more questions. Once the prosecution had finished their case, the defence raised a no-case-to-answer submission and the case collapsed. On the 4th of May 2012, Monaghan was acquitted by the judge. It's a dramatic moment, no matter what evidence has been led, that this case has been building and building and building, and somebody has been in the dock every day being tried for murder, and then it's just all over, just like that. Despite the collapse of the trial against Ross Monaghan, police continued the hunt for their other suspect, William Patterson. He was still believed to be hiding in Spain and had been put on the UK's most wanted list. In 2014, after more than four years of being on the run, Patterson handed himself into Spanish authorities and was extradited to Scotland. He came back to stand trial, saying through his defence that he thought he would be able to clear his name. A man has been charged with repeatedly shooting and killing a well-known Glasgow gangster outside a busy supermarket in front of terrified shoppers. Under a huge security presence, the first day of the trial of William Patterson took place in front of Judge Lord Armstrong at the High Court in Glasgow. Charged with the murder of Kevin Carroll, Patterson pleaded not guilty. What you really had here was people at a high level of organised crime in the city. William Parson was someone who was known to the police. So it was, a, it was a major trial. In court, the events surrounding the murder were set out for the jury. And five years on, witnesses gave their account of the shooting. I remember the atmosphere was at its most tense when members of the public came in to give their evidence. I remember a woman talking about, you know, a car screeching past her and her shimmying round the car because, you know, she wasn't sure what was going on. You know, they'd clearly never been in a high court setting before, given evidence before. They weren't used to the, the press pack outside and they were their names and faces were going to be on the evening news. None of the witnesses identified Patterson as one of the masked gunmen or the getaway driver. The prosecution case against William Patterson was what they call a circumstantial one. Uh, there's no eyewitnesses placing him at the scene, uh, so they have to rely on, on other bits and pieces, really present a kind of jigsaw. Prosecutor Ian McSporran presented the jury with DNA evidence from the plastic bag the murder weapons were found in. We had a bag which contained a gun and Patterson's DNA was found on the bag. Now, does that mean that you shot the gun? No, not necessarily. But what's your innocent explanation for having, having your genetic material being found effectively adjacent to the murder weapon? Certainly it was a, a good bit of evidence, but not enough in its own. They knew he was involved, but what they didn't know was whether William Patterson was the getaway driver or whether William Patterson was one of the gunmen. 
In Scots law, there's no crime of aiding and abetting. We analysed it from the perspective of what's called art and part guilt. And one way that judges usually use to explain this to juries is think of a bank robbery. You know, classically you'll have the getaway driver and you'll have the folk that run into the bank with the gun. What Scots law says is it doesn't matter whether you're waiting outside in the car with your foot on the pedal. It doesn't matter whether you're in the bank with a gun in your hands. All of these people are involved in a common criminal purpose. And therefore, everyone involved in that common criminal purpose is guilty of crimes committed by anyone involved. So in this case, it doesn't matter whether you were the person who pulled the trigger or whether you were the person behind the wheel who enabled the escape. If you involve yourself in a common criminal purpose, you're guilty of murder whether you pulled the trigger or not. The defence put their strongest evidence forward, Patterson's alibi. William Patterson denied that he was even at the car park at the time and claimed that he was at his girlfriend's house when Kevin Carroll was shot dead. But the prosecution laid out evidence that contradicted Patterson. People don't always appreciate that your mobile phone connects to cell towers. It can track your movements, your location, or at least the movements and locations of your phone. A cell site analysis expert explained to the court that Patterson's mobile could be traced to the supermarket car park seconds before the shooting. William Patterson said that he was at his girlfriend's home, but of course, that was thrown by the cell site analysis. It tracks him to Asda's car park, where the crime was committed. Then it takes him to the Coat Bridge Library, where the guns were found. In his closing statements, Prosecutor Ian McSporran told the High Court that while the case against William Patterson was circumstantial, his guilt was beyond reasonable doubt. But Des Finiston, defending, advised the jury that there was no direct evidence to say that the phone attributed to Patterson was with him on the day of the shooting. After 16 days, the jury retired to start its deliberations. That was the moment everyone was kind of waiting on, especially after Ross Monaghan had been, had been acquitted. We did wonder if, if Patterson was going to be acquitted as well. So it was quite palpable. It didn't take long. The jury returned its verdict that same day. And then the verdict was uh, he was guilty of murder. There was no real reaction from the accused. It was unusual given the fact that somebody had just been convicted of murder. William Patterson was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum period of 22 years. It took five years to bring William Patterson to justice, but of course there were three people in that car. There are two people still that haven't been convicted for the murder of Kevin Gerbil Carroll. What was unique about this trial was I think it laid bare for people the nature of Glasgow's underworld you know, the violence involved, the arrogance of people involved, that they think they can go to a supermarket at a lunchtime and just kill someone and not fear the consequences, the recklessness of it and the lawlessness of it. A murder hunt is underway in Lanarkshire after the death of a 32-year-old man. Surjit Singh Chokar, who was a waiter in an Indian restaurant, died in hospital after being found slumped in his car in the village of Overton. He was a family man, very close to me, very close to my mom and dad. And he went so quick. We miss him. He had returned home from work he was confronted by the three men. There was a, a, an argument, there was a fight, a scuffle, and Serge was, was stabbed, and he was stabbed tellingly in the heart and, and, and died pretty well instantly. Sergeet's girlfriend had witnessed the murder and was able to identify the alleged attackers to police. Within a week, three men had been arrested for the murder of Sergeet Singh Chokar. The three accused were Ronnie Coulter, his nephew, Andrew Coulter, and a friend called David Montgomery. With the suspects identified, police tried to establish a motive for the attack. Sergeant Singh Chokar uh, lived in uh, an area of uh, Wishaw called Gauk Thrapo in an apartment building. Uh, living in the building at the same time were Ronnie Coulter and uh, his nephew, Andrew Coulter, as well. 
On the morning of the day he died, Sarjeet's flat had been broken into. Andrew Coulter broke into Sarjeet Singh Choker's flat and in the flat he found a gyro check, an unemployment benefits check for just over £100. He got his uncle Ronnie Coulter to forge the signature on it and he was then able to cash it at a post office. Mr Choker's then partner found out about it. She had had a conversation with the two Coulters. The men believed that Sergeant was going to go to the police because he knew who had done it and when they confronted Sergeant that night, they believed that they had to stop him. With three arrests made only days after the murder, Sergeant's family believed they would soon get justice. When my brother was murdered, we were told that three people have been charged with his murder. And within a few days, two people were released and they kept one. The Crown took the decision initially only to indict Ronnie Coulter. They were pretty confident they had a case against Ronnie Coulter, but were less sure if they had the evidence really to back up charges against the other two men. The trial of Ronnie Coulter began in March 1999. For the Chokar family, this harrowing time was made more difficult by issues with communication between the authorities and the family. They never got in touch with my mom and dad to let them know that case is starting. And on Monday, when we went to the High Court, we never knew the name of the accused. All we knew was my brother's name, and we told them, and nobody was there to help us. The prosecution built their case around the events of the day Sarjeet was murdered. None of the three men denied ever not being there. I think the point was who had the knife and who used the knife. Coulter ran a defence of incrimination. It wasn't me who murdered Sergeant Singh Chokar, he said. It was my nephew and the other guy. After a week-long trial, the jury returned its verdict. Ronnie Coulter was cleared of murder. And so he was let out and he was hugging and cuddling his family happy and we were just like that with our mouth open. What's happening? What's going on? The case against one man was thrown out. The other two uh, could still be brought to trial, but are you being kept informed of what's going on there? No. Nobody's been telling us anything, my mum and dad or me. No, we don't know nothing. Following Ronnie Coulter's acquittal, the trial judge, Lord McCluskey, was highly critical of the Crown Office for failing to prosecute all three men suspected of killing Sergeet. It would seem straightforward and obvious that if there were three men present at an event which led to a man's death, that all three would go on trial. But the Crown maintained at the time there was not enough evidence of a sufficient quality to bring a prosecution together of all three men. After hearing the verdict on the news, a young law student decided to reach out to the Chokar family. I went, found out that the family went to the local Sikh temple um, in, um, in the south side of Glasgow. Somebody pointed out Manji, so when she came down to meet me, she was obviously, I would say the word was hostile, um, because she thought, who the hell am I? and I said I wanted to meet her mother and father and I wanted to offer my support and that if they wanted to campaign to get justice. Just two weeks later, the Chokar family justice campaign was launched. There were simple demands that were made. One was for a trial of the men, the reigning men who were accused of the murder of Sergei Singh Chokar. We wanted a public inquiry. The family wanted answers as to what had gone wrong. Four months later, in July 1999, the Crown Office recommended that the other two men implicated in the crime, Andrew Coulter and David Montgomery, should be tried. Their trial began on the 10th of November 2000 at the High Court in Glasgow. Well, Andrew Coulter and David Montgomery blamed Ronnie Coulter. In the first trial, Ronnie Coulter blamed those two. David Montgomery was acquitted of all charges while Andrew Coulter was convicted of housebreaking and assault. All hopes were dashed. I knew at that point in time that now the two trials had happened, that there was never going to be any chance of ever getting justice. Did the police and the Crown really think that Sajid's life was so cheap that his family would go away quietly? There are two systems of justice at work in this country, one for whites 
and a very different one for black people and the poor. The Scottish legal system is in the dock tonight. The Crown Office and the police have been accused of fundamental errors, professional incompetence and institutional racism. Following the verdict, the Lord Advocate Colin Boyd QC ordered two judicial inquiries into the handling of the murder case. Two investigations were run, one focusing on the police and their interactions with the family and their investigation of this crime and the racial dimensions to it, and one looking at the Crown Office and why it was that they reached this fundamentally mistaken decision. Amar Anwar and the Chukar family were unhappy with the decision not to hold a public inquiry. The whole point of a public inquiry is that that inquiry evidence is taken in public. It means that it is less likely that people's evidence, the authorities' evidence, will not be embellished. And there is a glare of public scrutiny, that spotlight on the case, which means it will hold the system accountable. The family made the decision to take no part in the judicial inquiries. But on the 24th of October 2001, they were invited to the Scottish Parliament to hear the Lord Advocate present the findings of the two reports. The family of Sergei Choker were failed by the police, the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal. One of the reports into the case identified institutional racism in the Scottish justice system. The Crown Office had been heavily um, criticised for the way that the previous trials had been conducted and actually that had, that had resulted in, in an apology from the then Lord Advocate. We failed the Choker family. The family have a genuine sense of grievance that justice has not been done. The fact is that we did not give ourselves the best shot at the prosecution. To that extent, the family's grievance that justice was not done by the prosecution is well founded. The investigation into the police and their interactions with the family was, was more critical. The police force at that time in their relationship with the Chokar family um, had reflected really institutional prejudice and structural racism. The inquiry also found institutional racism within the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Despite the criticisms of Strathclyde Police and the Crown Office, the Chokar family remained unhappy with the findings of the judicial inquiries. My family, my mom and dad and myself, we have suffered really badly. And they treated us really bad. We always knew that Sajid's murder was racially motivated. And from day one, they denied it. The police denied it. And at the first trial, and at the second trial, it was denied. And it continues to be denied. With the judicial inquiries over, it felt like justice would never be served for the Tukar family. But 10 years later, in 2011, Sergit's family were given fresh hope. While previously an accused person could not be tried twice for the same offence, New double jeopardy laws now meant, in limited circumstances, an acquittal could be scrapped and the police could reopen an investigation. I met with Manjit and said, what do you think? The family up for going back, giving it one last try. This is the last hope. And Manjit was up for it. He said, I don't know about my mum and dad because Mr Choker was extremely ill by then. He had cancer. And I begged him and I said, please, uncle, give me one last chance. In 2012, Strathclyde Police reopened their investigation into Sergit's murder. During their investigation, they received new intelligence which helped move the case forward. The new evidence was proof that Ronnie Coulter had subsequently admitted to stabbing Sergit Singh Chokar. Witnesses came forward, including his family members, saying he admitted to us that he actually committed this crime. With this new witness evidence, in 2014, prosecutors were given permission to retry Ronnie Coulter under the double jeopardy legislation. The court ruled that due to a lack of evidence, the other two men could not face trial again. A man has gone on trial accused of murdering an Asian man in North Lanarkshire almost 18 years ago. Ronnie Coulter denies killing Surjit Singh Chokar in November 1998 in Wishaw and trying to conceal the alleged crime. It definitely going into it, there, there was a huge amount of um, anticipation because it really had been one of the um, most high profile, most controversial, unsolved cases in, in, in Scottish legal history. Even third trial, we were scared. We thought, oh, he's going to walk free again the way he did. 
all we wanted was justice and we were very scared. After a long fight with cancer, Sarjeet's father had passed away the year before the trial came to court. Going into that courtroom every day didn't feel the same because it felt like your left arm is missing or your right arm is missing because he wasn't there. So the facts of the case, th that had all been relayed in court previously, twice. What was different in this case was the confession that Ronnie Coulter made to his sister. The sister of a man accused of the murder of a restaurant worker in North Lanarkshire almost 20 years ago has told the High Court in Glasgow that he claimed to have got away with the perfect murder. The former sister-in-law of Ronnie Coulter was the next to give evidence. Like his sister, she also claimed that he had admitted to the murder. His sister-in-law said Ronnie Coulter had used racial slurs when talking about Sergeet. On the 3rd of October, after a four-week trial, the jury retired for deliberation. Two days later, it reached its verdict in what had become one of Scotland's longest-running and most controversial murder cases. I had the ganty was on the right-hand side, Banji was on my left, and we were holding each other's hands. And the verdict came from and said, guilty, guilty of murder. And our heads sunk. We cried our hearts out. And Mrs Choker said, no. Now I can be at peace. My son can be at peace. My husband can be at peace. I've done my duty. And it marked a remarkable, long and thorough and painful campaign for justice from this family who had never given up, who had fought and fought through dreadful prejudice to get justice for, for Surgeon. Four weeks later, Ronnie Coulter was back in court where he was sentenced to a minimum of 19 years imprisonment. It took us 17, 18 years to fight for justice. And that's a very long time for families to suffer like that. It was a long fight for us, but in the end, we're happy that at least one person is behind bars 